Okay, so thanks Amy, Luna, Linda, Sophia, and Judy for your exciting performance. Hi everyone, welcome to the final session of TEDx Baby One High School events. So TEDx is a grassroots initiative created in the spirit of TED's overall mission to discover and research ideas worth spreading. Our this year's theme will be World Wisdom. It dives into the uncharted territories of the inner landscape of people, urging us to examine the core values and beliefs. It could be a unique place in your own heart, your busy campus life, or even the dynamic world outside. It's all dependent, it's all dependent on how you're going to define this theme. So as an organizer of this event, I hope that through TEDx, you could reflect, question, be moved, or find solace in the multiple worlds you inhabit. Okay, so without further delay, let's welcome our first speaker. Mr. George Lazo. Thank you, Cody. Um, I have been invited here today to talk to you about the truth, and especially how it relates to history and how historians understand the truth and uh, what the challenges that this new interpretation in historiography uh, is posing to historians all around the world. So, first I want to show you a picture that you might be already familiar with. And I want to ask you a question. Can we see historical truth in this painting? Can we learn something about history from it? Maybe you would say it's an unfair question because it is a painting, it's art. It's not supposed to represent history, it's not supposed to record history. So it is an unfair question. So perhaps a document that is written in written form and that is specifically um, purpose specific purposes to record history, perhaps that would give us a more accurate historical truth. What about this one? This is from a document called the Chronicle. It is a document that documents events as they happen in history. It was written in the year uh, 793, this particular entry, and it tells the story of Viking raiders arriving to England to uh, raid them. And it reads, uh, here were dreadful forewarnings come home over the land of Northumbria and woefully terrified the people. These were amazing sheets of lightning and whirlwinds and fiery dragons were seen flying in the sky. And we see historical truth. This is a document that is supposed to record history. Well, maybe you think that this is also an unfair question because this is an old document. It's not reliable. Maybe now we have gotten better at it. Maybe now we need something more modern, something that has been written Recently, about this. <laughs> Can we see historical truth there? And these are important questions in uh, historiography, which is the study of truth. So we have to go back to the beginning, to go back to the first meaningful one of the first meaningful challenges to the truth. And uh, that comes from this man called uh, Kierkegaard. He is uh, a 19th century philosopher, and he came up with the idea that there are two kinds of truth. He says one kind of truth is objective, and the other kind is subjective. So. You go into your kitchen, you open the refrigerator, 
The refrigerator says that it's 4 degrees Celsius. That is the objective truth. According to Kierkegaard, that is meaningless. When you put your hand into the refrigerator and you feel it's cold, you think it's cold, that is your subjective truth. The refrigerator is cold. According to him, that is truth. What we see here is an elevation of subjective personal truth to a category of valid truth. So the first time that somebody says, okay, people have different opinions, and these opinions can be considered true. Now, does it matter then who thinks what? Because if we all have our own truth, does that mean that all the truths are valid? Well, according to uh, Michel Foucault, a uh, 20th century philosopher and a historian, yes, it matters. It matters a lot who says what. Uh, he came up with a concept called the regime of truth. And so he says, truth is produced by virtue of multiple constraints, and it induces regulated effects of power, linked by a circular relation to systems of power which produce it and sustain it. Confused? Yes. Uh, what Foucault means is that truth is not only subjective, but truth is sustained by those in power. The people who have power are the ones in charge of the ones in charge of telling us what is true and what's more important, the mechanisms to discover and test the truth. They are the ones in charge of the system that maintains what the truth is. Now, going back to history, this is a problem for history, isn't it? Because then, if we have multiple versions of truth, how does that, how does that change the way that we approach history, or that we know and understand our own past? Traditionally, we have a historical event, and we have the fact. Traditionally, something happened in the past that is recorded, we read it now, and those are facts. What postmodernism comes to say, comes to tell us, is that there are multiple in-betweens. And so it looks more like this. We have a historical event, we have a witness. The witness has his or her own interpretation of things, his or her own priorities, biases, understandings, culture. And the historical event gets then filtered through all of that, gets recorded in language that becomes a book. A book that then we read with our own culture, with our own biases, with our own understanding. And that is our interpretation. So then, what we read is not the facts, but it is a reconstruction. And that is the challenge that historians now face. How are historians taking this in academia? Uh, those historians that work in big universities, how are they taking this challenge? How are they uh, grappling with this new way of interpreting the truth? Well, people like Harlan, David Harlan, sorry, says that postmodernism is it, it, an epistemological crisis. Or Lawrence Stone says that it's a crisis of self-confidence about what it is doing and how it is doing it. And by it, we mean history. What history is doing and how history is uh, doing it. 
or more vocal critics, like for example, Sir Geoffrey uh, Elton, who says it's menacing, it's destructive, it's absurd, meaningless, a virus, the ultimate heresy of frivolous nihilism. Historians are threatened by cosmogonism, threatened by this new way of viewing truth because it challenges the accessibility to the truth. If truth is not objective, then historians should not have a job. What is it that I think about all this? Um, in my master's uh, degree, I, when I was doing my master's degree in history and archaeology, talked about cosmogonism. It was a recurring theme in our classes. And I've come to the conclusion that postmodernism reminds us that we all have biases, we all have our own cultural bias, uh, our baggage that we carry with us. It reminds us that what we see and how we think about it is tainted by the way we think. Um, and that is unavoidable. However, I um, agree with British historiographer Keith Jenkins when he says, we can never really show the past. The gap between the past and history is such that no epistemological effort can bridge it. I agree with that, but I agree with it because he's making a distinction between the past and history. History is the interpretation of an objective truth. Something occurred, something happened. And as historians and as human beings, it's our responsibility to be very diligent in getting as close to the truth as possible, even if it's unattainable. I want to leave you with a quote by uh, Richard Evans, who wrote a book precisely on this called In Defense of History. And he says, the past really happened. And we really can, if we are very scrupulous and careful and self-critical, find out how it did and reach some tenable conclusions about what it all meant. Thank you.